appreciate the welcome. So here's how everything is going to go down today. So we're going to have quite a few sessions in and out. Our mentors are going to go around as well. But I want to start off by giving a hackathon briefing. So I'm going to call on Mr. Idon, the CEO of IT Web, to just give us a hackathon briefing of what we have to expect. All right? Mr. Ivan, please give him a round of applause. So we're here on a chilly morning in UJ, but I hope the day is going to heat up. Um, 20 years ago, I was a, I graduated from this university. It was still Litwatestrand Afrikaans University. Um, so it brings back a lot of memories and all these buildings. Um, I actually didn't attend my graduation. I wanted to be a musician, <laughs> and I only did it because I had to. Um, but years later, when I was eventually getting a corporate job, I came and I printed my degree here, um, and it still had value, and then you realized that Although I didn't understand it then, that education will always and forever have value. The theme, Gen Z versus Gen AI. Um, so apparently you guys are Gen Z. Uh, I'm an old millennium. I don't really understand everything about Gen Z. I know a lot of you, <laughs> I try to follow, but I'm not really sure what it is and what's going to come after Z. Um, and then we have Gen AI, and yeah, I use it, I see what it is, I follow it, but uh, I also really don't know, understand what it is. Um, that's really where tech lost me, I've been mean, doing good so far, but um, that's where it lost me. So I'll come back to the theme, but I'd like to talk about uh, what the heck hackathon is and why it matters. Um, so uh, in order to um, prepare, I tried out a different LLM, a large language role, um, Gemini instead of ChatGPT. Um, but uh, a technique that if you're passing your exams might be familiar to you, um, to write the speech. Um, I'd say that amongst other things, cybersecurity is a critical issue facing our world today. As technology continues to advance, so do the threats we face from cyber criminals. Um, agreeing that is true, it got me pondering why that is. And as a lifelong scholar, <laughs> I have to come up with some thesis, even if I only have ten minutes. <laughs> cyber security is to date the most important and most difficult discipline in all of IT. Um, from my perspective and the amount of money that's in the industry and there's lots of disciplines, you might be in technology, you can go into data analytics, you can go into uh, UX and design, um, you can go into legal and compliance, you can go into um, yeah, quite a few disciplines but somehow uh, Cybersecurity seems to be the most important one. Um, so why will that remain true? And yeah, with AI, it got me kind of thinking, well, maybe AI is going to be more important than cybersecurity, but then actually it got me thinking that, uh, no, you still have security. The big thing about AI now is the security of the data, the privacy of the data that it's using, uh, and actually as we learned today, uh, there's a terrifying threat that maybe people can model poisoning or make these models evil and actually start using this technology for not it's what it's intended for. So technologies, so Jenna I said, as technologies advances, so do the threats. So, we can kind of already understand that with cyber we can 
sit on the border of Switzerland, steal from someone in China or anywhere around the world, or the other way around, or whatever. Um, we don't have to go rob a bank. Maybe now we can steal money without even being there. Um, we're using this technology for other things, but because the technology is there, it's also enabling different kinds of crime. <coughs> yeah, and we can't really imagine that uh, stealing will go away, um, at least not in the foreseeable future. So my whole pattern of thesis actually revolves that it's human nature. Until some state of time that we come to singularity, but for now, I don't know, crime and cheating and whatever, that's a different thesis for psychology, why that is. Um, sometimes it might even feel justified, but it does exist. And it might not be our nature, but we have to be aware that there are people who are feeling those things with this their nature. And that they might use that technology to attack us, or our business, our country, whatever. <coughs> so, the IT Web Security Summit is the longest running and biggest event for the cybersecurity industry locally. It's a great affair. Um, and the IT Web Security Summit Hackathon runs alongside. Um, from the group surround, uh, 50 will come through and be alongside this great event where you have access to uh, every who's who of the cybersecurity industry in the country and some international guests. Um, and the idea thon is where we are, the UJ edition, the IT Web Security Summit Hackathon, idea thon, UJ edition. <laughs> And it's, yeah, where we'll try to, to learn and have a competition. Um, so on the theme of Gen Z versus Gen AI, um, it's really something that you'll need to figure out what that means. We're calling you the generation hacker because the country has so much hope the world continent has so much hope, the world has so much hope on your generation and these coming generations that they're really going to not just your families, everybody's got hope that these coming generations and the digital revolution is going to bring Africa back to some of the glory that we know it had when the pyramids were around. So that's a big responsibility. Um, for the format, you can create your own um, cybersecurity solution. Disclaimer, this is insanely difficult. You can showcase what defensive measures you put to protect your app and users and why they're so secure with you, or you can come up with any of your own ideas, um, but these ideas have to be good. Um, there's quite a few participants. Um, what I think will be most interesting to, to all of you is the challenges that the partners have uh, prepared. And uh, shout out to uh, Telspace, Kalani from Orange Cyber Defense, the Snow Cyber Technologies, the CompTIA, and Jason, his national friend. Um, for setting these up, uh, and they'll tell you more about these and how these work. Um, so the focus is on skill building. For today, and let's just shout out to uh, all the fantastic people with all the fantastic job titles that you might aspire to have for yourself one day. All right, so we're going to have our MD slash founder of Custodian Advisor, Advisory Services, our digital fossil, Mr. Steve Jump. The reality is I'm here to talk about what are we going to be doing with the ideas in our We have a theme for the contest. 
generation Z versus generative AI. Um, as always, I get thrown in at the beginning so that everything else you hear on the rest of the day is going to sound so much better. Basically, my job is to set the level so everyone else can shine. Now, when we move into the future, we bring with us our understanding of today. We like to classify ourselves. I'm going to get on to classification and why it's a good idea in the back. Today, I'm going to press a button after that. This wonderful gentleman, uh, modeled on my own style of eyewear, uh, is actually an AI generated image. Uh, I play around with this stuff just to make sure that uh, I can keep up to date. I actually get paid to advise corporations on what AI needs. Uh, here's a hint. When I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> Gen Z categorized people who grew up with technology. We talk about Gen AI, it's generative AI. If there's going to be a generation AI, we've already classified that, we're probably going to call it generation alpha. Generation Alpha, for those of you who aren't trying to keep up here, and it, it's only people like me who do research about sociology and technology who even have these classifications. We just live in the first group. Generation Alpha is anybody born after 2010. The significance is that if you were born in 2010, there's a very good chance that you grew up chewing on an iPad. Is the first generation that will have 100% digital possible life. Now, we are coming into that. We've got a responsibility because the life that they are going to be entering into or are already in, in many ways, is going to be driven by the ideas that we have now. And those ideas are driven on our experience, our current needs. And if we're doing it right, they should be aimed at some of the future needs. So for us to be here, to be capable, to be competent of building the future for which we already have a generation that's going to consume it, we need to be ready to hack. Is anybody here ready to hack? Woo! Well, three of you, good. And the rest? Well, I can't actually see you out there, so make some sound. Are you ready to hack?
indistinguishable from reality. This is the starting point in your careers. Understanding that we can now manipulate data. Did I mention that data is used to represent every physical element that we use in our society today? So we already have a problem space in the working with the difference between imagination, fantasy, reality, and crime has become very difficult. But it's not impossible, it's a data problem. Anybody prepared to enter into the data problem or data problems? Because our future is data. There's no getting around it. Unless we manipulate data, use it, make it manageable in a way that is trustworthy and provably trustworthy, we actually don't have much of a pleasant future. This is where your hackathon skills are going to take you. If you want to get into this world, understand what can go wrong, understand what can go right, and choose to be a force for right. By the way, those of you who will choose the force for wrong, Please be aware in this particular form, you're outnumbered, we will get you. <laughs> and in case we don't immediately, we'll have the data trail. But seriously, it is a data problem, and that data is whatever you want it to be, whatever you need it to be. If you don't have it, go out and get it. If you've got the data, make sure it is telling you what you need it to tell you. You can't say it was somebody else's. You are in the middle. The moment you process it, you actually become part of the problem. So, generative AI. So I, I often stand up in front of groups of people who have no idea what gen AI means. So I spell out generative, pre-trained, <coughs> transformer. We take information, we process it, the layer that is most commonly recognized is when we can talk to something, we can ask a natural language question of the body of information, and it will process it, and it will give us what is statistically likely to be the best response to our question. It's an opinion, a statistically likely opinion. That is the majority of the public perception is so much more than that. But it's a good place to start because we have so much data to mine, these are the tools that can help us get value. Uh, those of you who have been uh, reading all the horror stories in the news about AI realize that most AI processing engines have great difficulty in recognizing fact from fiction because they are reading language that nobody told them that language and lie. As human beings, we are fairly well versed in that practice. Everything that we do, we should be looking at. So, understanding what we're doing, making sense of it, the access to it, and enable the power of that data. And remember, power can be used in many, many ways. We are using the power in this room for electricity, lights. If you put your finger into an electric socket, doesn't end well. It's the same power. The power of the data that we're going to be manipulating and putting into these projects has a power for good, it has a power for evil. To recognize evil, you can stop it. If you assume that the world is fantastic and golden and everything is good, we may have problems. So part of that is in your solution, you will design it. Now the exciting part is Everything is possible. When you start to discover that the power of the possible is within your hands, you will start to appreciate that power. It is addictive, seductive, and it is something that is going to drive you into a career immensely powerful and very satisfying. I'm hoping you're going to be driven to do good with your ideas and your designs. But everything that you do touches other people. So, when you are designing, think about what might happen if you make a mistake. This is my cat. I call him Schrodinger. Cats like boxes. 
you've never had a cat, you don't appreciate it. You want to take your cat to the vet, you put an empty box in the middle of the room, and the cat will climb into it. Cats like boundaries. Humans like boundaries. We are automatically classifying creatures. The mere fact that you are here listening to me, listening to today, means that somewhere in your ancestry, uh, the category, categorization of prey and predator was successfully mapped such that we avoided the things that ate us and managed to eat the things we needed to survive. By definition, if that wasn't in your genes, you wouldn't be here. That categorization is built in and it's powerful. It's how we get through a complicated world. You will find that you classify things automatically without thinking about them. I need you to think about that. You need to be aware of the boundary. The boundaries are good, but you don't ever want to let that boundary become a block. You don't want to be a captain. Or maybe not be a captain, but that's up to you. But if you don't understand the environment outside of the box you build around your solution, you're probably not building a complete enough solution for it to be So that means whenever you're engaged in a problem, ask outside the problem space, look beyond the problem in front of you. That problem might be the part that's exciting you the most. Your self-awareness of how to solve that problem is what's getting you out of bed in the morning or preventing you from going to bed because you basically just run a 36-hour coding session because you're that motivated. But if you are not looking outside the boundary of your problem, there may be surprises. So it's always best to take a step back, look widely, and understand the context of your problem in the greatest space that you're working in. And a second line for that is, when you're looking at that, understand what the implications are. If your amazing design goes wrong, will your customers want their money back? Or will the boat you're steering accidentally hit a large bridge? That's not a joke, it did happen. The lights went out and the bridge fell down. That was a bad day. Imagine <coughs> what it was like for the person who designed the navigation computer system for that boat. Because when the lights went out, it switched off. It didn't come back on for half an hour. Was that something you could have foreseen? So in your design, in your hack at the moment, where in my security hack is not. We're going to be asking really complicated questions. Are you designing it securely? Do you understand the implications of insecure? How do you prove to us that it is secure? And that's for people doing the conventional hack on the part of the secure based product. What about those of you who are taking the challenge for a red and blue flag or red and blue team? Capture the fan challenge. We are hoping that your thought processes and challenges will stimulate you to think beyond those lessons and how you can use them in your future designs and your future problems. Where do we fit in? Uh, I was going to read this out and sound like I was really, really clever. Um, sadly, at the moment, I would need reading glasses for that. So, uh, I think I would have said something about solving problems. Making sure that when we build something with maps, and basically I am very repetitive. It comes down to the point of do we know what is going to go wrong? Are we able to handle that and fit that into our design, but without losing track of that initiative, that emotion, and the power of controlling it? But remember, we're dealing with magic here. That magic is our brain fixing problems in the world. We don't ever want to let go of that magic. But we also don't want to let that magic get out of control so it starts to do harm. So we have that responsibility. But we also have the need to solve those problems in a way that stay solved. And that's part of our design thinking process. Security actually starts with you. No matter what your chosen career path, 
need to make sure that everything that you do doesn't end up doing harm after you've been paid for it. So, I will leave you with this thought. Uh, that's not my alter ego. Well, that's actually why I'm wearing shades. Things you can go wrong. That is not the uh, advanced artificial intelligence I envisage in my future. I would like to keep him or her <coughs> in the movies. Uh, that's all I have for you.
Seems like it's tanking. Let's see. Let's try again. Yay. Okay, so moving into the agenda, one thing that I'm going to touch on is a simple definition of an analysis is. Then we'll move on to you know, understanding the goals of what threat analysis um, involves, why it matters, who does it, and then we're going to conclude, and then we're going to take questions from you guys. In terms of the definition, um, straightforward, threat analysis is a process of identifying, assessing, and understanding potential threats to a system, organization, or an, an individual. Um, so when you do threat analysis, it's not a simple task. Like for us as ethical hackers, we're mainly focusing on systems as well as the human element. Um, where is the likelihood of gaining an entry point into you know, compromising um, an organization for a specific goal that we have set out as an objective um, in the initial stages? But for you, how will this be applicable? It will be applicable as you're building your application, you need to take that into consideration. You need to understand or identify or understand what threats that could likely be used against your system. Um, that, that is applicable to your solution. So I wanted to put it out there to say, hey, this is not necessarily applicable to say, hey, it's a system. It's a system that you're building. You might grow to be an organization. And for those individuals that are going to consume the application, you need to understand what are the threats that they might be susceptible to. An additional explanation around what that implies. Various types of threats that could impact the CIA trial. Um, I think you'll hear a lot of that in some of confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Um, it's something that is at the core whenever we're building system or whenever we um, 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 assessing systems from an ethical hacking perspective. We always think about that. Because those are the core components that actually defines what impact that threat or that attack has got to an organization or an individual. And then the last part of this definition speaks to why threat analysis matter. It matters in terms of helping an organization or you as an individual to understand what the threat is going to do or how is it composed, what is the impact that it will have. I mean, how many of you would say tonight, after we conclude this um, event, we can just walk down at Bree Taxi Rank with our phones in our hands? How many of you would do that? I need volunteers, you can come with me. I have karate training. You understand? It's, it applies on your day to day. You cannot just wake up and say, I'm going to Bree Taxi Rank, I'm going to walk with my phone in my hand, and literally nothing is gonna to happen to me. Threat analysis is applicable also on a personal level, and it's something that you do, but because it's so natural, you don't even know that it's something that is documented and applies to you know, additional things that we, in the world of work, interact with on a daily. So in terms of identification of threats, so there are sources of threats, um, malicious actors are one, so hackers, we have a lot of hackers in the house, many is one, but it's ethical, so please don't give him the eye. Um, Jared is also one, don't give him the eye, it's also ethical. Um, so those are the people, or those are some of the sources of threats. When you are building your solution, you need to think about that, to which hackers, or are hackers going to come after my solution? And then one that was covered by Intimity, it's around the vulnerabilities. As you're building your system, what are the vulnerabilities that can be found on your system and that can be exploited by attackers out there? And then the last one is around environmental factors. So you guys are going to host your solution server. Think about the redundancy. So back to the CIA triad, in terms of availability, if wherever you hosted your application, there is, I would say, load sharing, do they have backup power so that your application can remain to be live and serve its purpose and serve its consumers? You guys need to think about that. Those are also the threats that affect the CIA trial. 
So you guys need to think about all the environmental factors that might be applicable to how you've built your solution, how you have it housed, and how you have it accessible to your consumers. And then how do you assess this? How do you carry out the threat analysis to assess the threats? The likelihood is key. You need to understand how likely is this threat to be used against my solution. And how do you then fulfill that? There's various, various frameworks that you can use. I just mentioned threat modeling as one, which has got um, you know, a methodology that you can follow um, to understand from initially identifying the threat up to a point where you need to render the mitigation, what would be the likely steps that you would need to take to remediate that. And the other thing that is key, you know, impact is key with everything that you do. If you do not understand the impact, you won't understand the priority of the threat that you are facing at hand. So you need to define or determine what the impact is. What impact would this have to my solution? And the last one is obviously how is all of this going to help you? This is going to help you to decide on next steps. Perhaps, okay, now you know this vulnerability is key because one, it's got a severe impact. Um, if it's exploited, this attacker can gain access to the database and be able to you know, exfiltrate all the data that we have within the organization, etc. With that knowledge, after you know the impact, you can then decide on next steps. Do I not switch off the application so that no one can access it until I've remediated the issue? Or do I have a way around that I can imply or apply rather so that this is remediated? And then on to understanding threat actors, I think this is key. You don't need to do it extensively like many of them would do. You just need to high level understand who are the threat actors, what tactics are they using, which methodologies are they following, etc. There are various tools, various frameworks, various open source resources that you can use to find out that information. So now that we're managing security in a rapidly evolving cyber ecosystem, how about we do a threat uh, analysis with Chulani Mabuza? Okay, so moving into the agenda, one thing that I'm going to show you is a simple definition of what threat analysis is. Then we'll move on to you know, understanding the goals of what threat analysis um, involves, why it matters, who does it, and then we're going to conclude, and then we're going to take questions from you guys. In terms of the definition, um, straightforward, Threat analysis is a process of identifying, assessing, and understanding potential threats to a system, organization, or an, an individual. Um, so when you do threat analysis, it's not a simple task. Like for us as ethical hackers, we mainly focusing on systems as well as the human element. Um, where is the likelihood of gaining an entry point into you know, compromising um, an organization for a specific goal that we have set out as an objective um, in the initial stages. But for you, how will this be applicable? It will be applicable as you're building your application, you need to take that into consideration. You need to understand or identify or understand what threats that could likely be used against your system. Um, that, that is applicable to your solution. So I wanted to put it out there to say, hey, this is not necessarily applicable to say, hey, it's a system. It's a system that you're building. You might grow to be an organization. And for those individuals that are going to consume the application, you need to understand what are the threats that they might be susceptible to. An additional explanation around what that implies. Various types of threats that could impact the CIA trial. Um, I think you'll hear a lot of that in terms of confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Um, it's something that is at the core whenever we're building systems or whenever we um, 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 assessing systems from an ethical hacking perspective. We always think about that because those are the core components that 
actually defines what impact that threat or that attack has got to an organization or an individual. And then the last part of this definition speaks to why threat analysis matter. It matters in terms of helping an organization or you as an individual to understand what the threat is going to do or how is it composed, what is the impact that it will have. I mean, how many of you would say tonight, after we conclude this um, event, we can just walk down at Bree Taxi Rank with our phones in our hands? How many of you would do that? I need volunteers, you can come with me. I have karate training. You understand? It's, it applies on your day to day. You cannot just wake up and say, I'm going to Bree Taxi Rank, I'm going to walk with my phone in my hand, and literally nothing is going to happen to me. Threat analysis is applicable also on a personal level, and it's something that you do, but because it's so natural, you don't even know that it's something that is documented and applies to you know, additional things that we, in the world of work, interact with on a daily. So in terms of identification of threats, so there are sources of threats, um, malicious actors are one, so hackers, we have a lot of hackers in the house. Many is one, but it's ethical, so please don't give him the eye. Um, Jared is also one, don't give him the eye, is also ethical. Um, so those are the people, or those are some of the sources of threats. When you are building your solution, you need to think about that. Which hackers, or are hackers going to come after my solution? And then one that was covered by the Dumeti, it's around the vulnerabilities. As you build in your system, what are the vulnerabilities that can be found on your system and that can be exploited by attackers out there? And then the last one, it's around environmental factors. So you guys are going to host your solution server. Think about the redundancy. So back to the CIA triad, in terms of availability, if wherever you hosted your application, there is, I would say, load sharing, do they have backup power so that your application can remain to be live and serve its purpose and serve its consumers? You guys need to think about that. Those are also the threats that affect the CIA trial. So you guys need to think about all the environmental factors that might be applicable to how you've built your solution, how you have it housed, and how you have it accessible to your consumers. And then how do you assess this? How do you carry out the threat analysis to assess the threats? The likelihood is key. You need to understand how likely is this threat to be used against my solution. And how do you then fulfill that? There's various, various frameworks that you can use. I just mentioned threat modeling as one, which has got um, you know, a methodology that you can follow um, to understand from initially identifying the threat up to a point where you need to render the mitigation, what would be the likely steps that you would need to take to remediate that. And the other thing that is key, you know, impact is key with everything that you do. If you do not understand the impact, you won't understand the priority of the threat that you are facing at hand. So you need to define or determine what the impact is. What impact would this have to my solution? And the last one is obviously, how is all of this going to help you? This is going to help you to decide on next steps. Perhaps, okay, now you know this vulnerability is key because one, it's got a severe impact. Um, if it's exploited, this attacker can gain access to the database and be able to you know, exfiltrate all the data that we have within the organization, etc. With that knowledge, after you know the impact, you can then decide on next steps. Do I not switch off the application so that no one can access it until I've remediated the issue? Or do I have a way around that I can imply or apply rather so that this is remediated? And then on to understanding threat actors, I think this is key. You don't need to do it extensively like many of them would do. You just need to high level understand who are the threat actors, what tactics are they using, 
which methodologies are they following, etc. There are various tools, various frameworks, various open source resources that you can use to find out that information. Everyone? Okay. I go. Where are we? Okay. Are, are, are we at the party of, of, of Garabo? <laughs> no, we're not, we're not at Garabo's party right now. Let's show some energy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, South Africa. Good morning, morning Northern Cape. Good morning, KwaZulu yeah. Town. Yeah. Hey, hoy. All right, so indeed, it is a good morning. And um, as introduced, my name is Diani Gonyama. I do some stuff at an organization called Geek Culture. And um, I've, I've been asked, I've been asked to come give a layout in terms of the idea for in terms of um, what the actual heck. But before that, I just want to do a quick check. How many of us have never attended a hackathon before? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. So a quick rundown in terms of a hackathon. You know a marathon, right? Yes. I, I don't want to assume. Does anyone know what a marathon is? All right, so in a marathon, we've got a lot of people coming together, like-minded people, they've got different backgrounds, they've got different skill sets, they've got different, um, this guy is defeating me. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, you have got different kinds of skill sets, you've got different kinds of personalities coming together to essentially say that um, we want to get to a certain goal. We want to um, start the journey and get to the end. So at a hackathon, essentially, you are coming together with um, like-minded people with different um, skill sets, um, with different um, technological knowledges from different institutions. And um, you are essentially saying that we want to put our thoughts together, come up with a solution, and then use technological tools to build a solution. Are we clear? So, we are using different tools, including our minds. Oh, so I'm supposed to just stand here and look cute, right? <laughs> just smile. Just smile. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know sometimes technology does fail you. But what could go wrong? What could go wrong? And, and, and we got introduced to, to Schrodinger's cat, right? We saw Schrodinger here on stage and we met his cat. So, oh wow, okay. <laughs> I'm talking to Jen Z. But um, yeah, so at, at a hackathon, essentially, you are coming up with um, ideas. You use your, your mindset, you use your skills, you use different tools to come up with a, with, uh, with a solution. So, what, what um, we are going to be doing at this particular hacker for essentially, um, we've got a very specific focus. So, this is a cyber security hackathon. The first person that we are asking is, um, are you able to build innovative, secure solutions? Are you able to build an app that is addressing a certain need in a certain sector for a certain market to essentially ensure that you are not compromising the dignity of the end user, you are not uh, compromising the infrastructure, you are using best practices in the industry, you are using um, the best tools, we are using different thinking um, within a team to be able to ensure that we are able to build a secure solution. So if you want to come up with an app um, that will help us find water here at UJ, for example, that app, <laughs> that app, uh, uh, the concern of this hackathon is, is that app secure? So th 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 that's the first thing about the, the, the hackathon. Um, are you able to build a secure solution? That's essentially the, the, the first thing. 
And then the second part, um, of which is an, an exclusive um, uh, uh, um, addition to the security summit hackathon, is essentially has to do with um, can you use AI to, to detect threats? So you'll be learning up about that as well. And then um, the, fourth, the third question, rather, um, has to do with um, are you able to team up and um, ensure that you are uh, essentially offensive? You are able to attack a scenario, you are able to, to, to attack um, a system based on a scenario, so you will be taken through that as well. And then the last part is are you able to make defense sexy? So are you able to be on the defense uh, side in terms of, um, of the CTF? So um, I'll, I'll repeat in terms of the four crucial things of this hackathon. Firstly, are you able to build a secure solution? Secondly, are you able to use AI to detect threats? And then, um, third, are you able to be on the offensive side? Whoa, okay. Testing, testing, testing ABC, testing ABC. All right. And then, um, lastly, um, has to do with defense. And um, the hackathon has got to, uh, has got two folds. So we are right now at the ideathon. Then this ideathon, um, as they have already said, is intended for 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 a few things. Firstly, um, to enlighten you. So you have got a range of presenters that are coming here on stage. They will be sharing sharing knowledge. They will be sharing best industry practices. They will be sharing tools. They will be sharing with you mechanisms on how to get started, on how to build a solution, or how to um, go about um, uh, taking part in the CTF challenge, um, and also uh, from an AI perspective. And then um, the second part of the idea thought is to then give the power to you to start thinking. Start thinking about those ideas. Start thinking about how are you going to participate in the CTF challenge. Start thinking about um, the, 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 the the, the, the other challenge as well in terms of, um, of, of, of um, a, uh, threat detection with AI. Um, and then um, um, the, the, the last part um, would be the consolidation of your thinking to ensure that um, when you live here, or when you leave that call for those that are joining virtually, you are best guided in order to then finalize your solution and be able to submit. So. I've just spoken about uh, um, the need to submit. We have sent a link to Songken, so um, if you have not received the invite, do not panic. Um, we will still send the invite, but check your junk folder as well um, for, for the invite. So your team need to be on Songken because we're going to use the Songken platform to essentially um, set submission of your uh, um, solution. So on Songken, um, some of you have been engaging, but would be providing more guidance in terms of how do you then go about uh, 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 starting off your, uh, uh, um, your your team and uh, uh, subsequently submitting. Yeah, and, and um, yes, so we do have um, a number of mentors uh, that are here for your assistance. Um, there are mentors here physically, there are mentors uh, virtually as well, but um, up until the 30th of, of April, you can engage with some of the mentors on Soike. So do feel free to inbox. And some of them have got very funny funny names. So, so we are going to, 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 to introduce all the mentors um, on Soike so that you're able to, to, to engage with them. And, and then um, you'll then be able to submit. Um, and then after submission, certain number of teams um, will be selected. Uh, because um, uh, the hackathon is limited. So a certain number of teams, uh, where is she going? Our next presenter is going away. Yeah, um, so, so um, there will be a selection process and then the, the main hackathon will take place 4 to 5 June at the Central Convention Center. And um, obviously uh, there are prizes as part of that. But the key thing, of today is to ensure that you are better enlightened. Is to ensure that you have started of your thought process in terms of, of, of the challenges and um, you are able to get insights from industry leaders and, and, and thereafter go on to submit. 
Uh, with that, I will end it here. Thank you.
make sure that you've kept security in mind. All right, so having gone into that, uh, a lot of things that you will hear very often is authorization and authentication. Those are not the same thing, okay? You need to consider when authorization is important, when authentication is important, and what you need to consider for both. I'm going to leave it to you to find out a bit more about that. I'm here for the day. When you're interested, I will come and answer you. A lot of the mentors can also tell you about that, but I think it's also important that you guys start learning to know where to look for things. Okay, because a lot of what's involved in the security space is a lot of uh, information that's coming up daily, it's changing daily, and you need to know where to find your information. So the difference between authorization and authentication is very important. And then, um, because this is application focused, uh, we're going to be looking at things like web security. Okay, that's for uh, uh, applications that are hosted, say, online, let's say, in the web, on the internet. We're going to be looking at mobile security, that is for devices that you can move around. It's not limited to your phone, it includes tablets, it includes watches. These days our fridges are talking, our washing machines are talking, those are mobile devices. Okay, And then we're also going to be looking at API security. So a lot of people don't necessarily know what an API is, and um, I like food a lot, so I always use this example. You can think of an API as a waiter at a restaurant, okay? So you are the customer, which would be one side of the system, and then you've got the chef, which is another side of the system, and you've got an API that is just telling this person what that person is asking for, and taking what that person is giving and giving it to that person. So it's taking things between systems. But in between that communication, it also needs to be secure, okay? So I've said a mouthful, but that's good because I, I warned you guys about these new pads. Okay, and then also um, I'm bringing this up because in the previous session that we had, somebody asked why is the focus so much on application security? And the feedback that we gave is that because this is sort of an API, uh, sorry, an application-based hackathon and ideathon. However, in your considerations, I'm hoping that you guys have heard of the OC model. OC model stands for Open Systems Interconnected. Sorry, we don't we almost never know what these things stand for, but we know what they are. So the OC model, OSI, it speaks to all of the layers that are in an IT system, and all of them do need protection. An example I'll give is physical. Physical, you still need physical security, and just because your application is online, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't know what the physical security of your solution systems, databases, servers is, right? But when you look through the AC or the OC model, just make sure that uh, you are taking consideration into what potentially could you learn from the other aspects of security there. Because you are here today from a, a hackathon perspective, but if you're looking at a career in cybersecurity, just look at the OC model and where you think you would fit in there from a security perspective. Uh, there are also other things, and we can talk about careers at that stage, but that's cool. Then um, we had one of our speakers that was going to be talking about cybersecurity frameworks and policies. Unfortunately, she's a bit hung up. So I'm going to list some policies, some frameworks that you could um, look into some things that would give you a bit of insight from the cybersecurity perspective. And uh, we've got the, what is called the NIST cybersecurity framework. I'll speak slowly. This is really important. I want you to write it for me. So a lot of people use data privacy and security interchangeably. It's not the same thing, okay? Security and privacy together um, result in data security. So when you are looking at privacy, you're looking at a person's identity. When you're looking at security, you're looking at protecting those systems' confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Okay? Uh, and then from a South Africa perspective, we've got something called POPIA, P-O-P-I-A, 
and um, um, we'll get into that. But it's just things that you need to know. Um, have an overview about it. I know you guys use ChatGPT. Ask ChatGPT to summarize some of those things for you. And then, cool. So I'm going to get into my presentation now. Uh, we don't have it up here, but like I did say, we'll share it up on the screen. But I'm going to be talking about OWASP Top 10. So from the OWASP Top 10, um, OWASP is a, an open source you know, a, a, a application security project. That's what it stands for. And uh, it's, it's freely available. Okay, So if you do look for OWASP Top 10 or OWASP on your machine, you should find a lot of information. And what I'm going to delve into is what a vulnerability is, what a business risk is, and what a mitigation strategy is. Okay, so from a vulnerability perspective, think of it just like humans would be. When you say you are vulnerable, it means you are feeling a bit soft and weak, right? Um, and so uh, that's the same thing for systems. A vulnerability in a system uh, is a weakness in a system that can be exploited or taken advantage of. So when they say we found a vulnerability, that means that could potentially be an easy point of entry for a criminal to come into the system when they shouldn't be, right? So remember what a vulnerability is because it's something that will be very important as part of this hackathon to say, how many vulnerabilities does your system have? How weak is your system? Or what are the weaknesses that you found at the beginning and you worked your way forward from there, okay? And then also we're looking at business risk. So business risk is looking at what are some of the things that impact the organization's profit. And cybersecurity is always a business risk, especially because IT is at the base of every organization. And that's why I made the example about socks. You can be selling socks online. You must consider cybersecurity. Just because it sucks doesn't mean the information that's being processed there is any less important than a banking system, okay? Because you're still processing people's data. If you're processing payments, there are things that you need to consider there as well, um, okay? And then uh, there's an example also that I used. I know that my time is running out, but when we're looking at data and how machines are learning and looking at AI specifically, I want you guys to Google tall, dark, and handsome, and I want you to go to images. Does anybody have something? Has somebody seen something? Is there any, how many people are shocked? Let's just have a raise of hands. Don't be scared. Tall, dark, and handsome, go to images. Okay, so that is a bit of a shock factor. That is an example of something that needs to be considered from a business risk perspective because what you're seeing there is an algorithm at work, okay? So a machine has learned that the people you're seeing there are tall, dark, and handsome. And um, they're definitely handsome, I'll give them that. Whether they're dark or not, we don't know, you can scroll through. But the only reason we are able to gauge whether that information is true or not is because we know what we are expecting to see. And if you are put in a situation, let's say you're working in health, you're working in retail, you're working in banking, and you're trying to find information, and you are getting the wrong information, if you don't know that it's wrong, you are putting the business at risk. And so one of the things that we need to consider as part of security is when we are teaching machines, are we giving them enough knowledge to be able to return the correct values? Are we giving them the correct information to give out the correct information that people are requesting? So keep that in the back of your mind as well. Just have some research, do some things around how machine learning and AI and algorithms are actually impacting security and what does this potentially mean for the future and how can you stop that from happening, okay? And then a mitigation strategy, what mitigation is, is lowering the impact of something. So think of a seatbelt as a mitigation strategy, okay? Um, you're not going to stop driving just because you've heard of all the car accidents. What you're going to do is wear a seatbelt so that if something happens to you, you're a little more safe, okay? And that's what it is with security. Technology is everywhere, breaches are everywhere, cyber attacks are everywhere but we wear our seatbelts. 
And so you can't always eliminate the problem, but there are things that you can do to lessen the impact. So you need to think about your solution and how you can actually reduce the impact. What are the seat belts on your solution? Okay, are you drinking and driving? You've got problems. Okay, are you not wearing your seat belt? We've got problems. Are your lights not working? You've got problems. Are your brake lights not working? You've got problems. And even if all those things are working, it doesn't mean you won't be in a car accident. Just remember that, okay? So now we're gonna go into the OWASP top 10. Um, okay, we'll share this with you. OWASP top 10, we've got 10 um, vulnerabilities that are recognized as vulnerabilities that are most exploited. They are not the only vulnerabilities that exist. And when you bring up vulnerabilities that are um, present in systems, most of the time, these will be the umbrella terms for those vulnerabilities. So, because it's not up on the screen, I'll speak slowly and then I'm done. I can see the um, show you time. So we've got something called broken object level authorization. We're starting to get technical now, okay? And um, the business risk of that is unauthorized access to the data and the data resources, okay? And I will be sharing this with you. So um, it's okay if you just write down what the vulnerability is or if you just uh, keep in your mind to look up who was top 10 because all that information will be there as well. And how we can um, prevent that is implementing proper access controls and proper authorization um, mechanisms using things like OAuth0, surprise, surprise, we're getting very technical, and then also looking at API keys. Okay, and then you've got something called broken authentication, and it also, the business risk would be unauthorized access or identity theft. And then how you can mitigate against that is using strong authentication mechanisms and then also enforcing secure passwords, also using OWASP 2.0 and JWT. You are getting the presentation, don't freak out. And then we've also got excessive data exposure, which could result in data breaches and leakage of sensitive information. And what you need to do there is encrypting your data using proper access controls. And from an access controls perspective, I'm gonna give you guys an example of marks, right? The last thing you want is one student having access to everybody's marks throughout UG. When you log into the school student portal, you want to see your information. If you are able to see everybody's information, that is an example of not properly implementing access controls. It means you need to use the time. Sorry, yeah, I'm stop showing the time. It means that you to, you're only supposed to have access to the information that you're supposed to have access to. Not everybody should have access to everybody's marks. Um, and then also we've got um, lack of resources and rate limiting. So um, that could result in a denial of service attack. And that means your system getting way too many requests that it, that it can process at the same time or getting a service disruption. So every time you go to home affairs and they tell you the system is down, they might just facing a denial of service attack. I'm saying might. Nobody must hold me against that. Okay? Um, and then also uh, broken functional level authorization. So that's looking at your APIs. Okay? And then also mass assignment. That's unauthorized access to object properties. We've got security misconfiguration. Always look at how you're configuring your systems what you are and are not allowing, okay? And so those frameworks that I've told you about, they will be able to give some guidance in terms of what's the best way that's going to be recognized. And then we've got SQL injection. I think that's one that people would have heard about. That's when um, your text boxes validate your text boxes. If you're asking for an ID number, a person should not be able to put letters and special characters in there because the last thing you want is someone running a code through your text box and dropping a database in the back end, okay? So always think about your input validation. And then improper asset management, we always say you can't protect what you don't know. Know what your assets are. As much as you're going to integrate all these technologies and tools, know what they are and know what their risks are so that you can manage those risks. And insufficient logging and monitoring. You need to know what your system is doing. This is either so that you can pick up unusual behaviors 
Or if something's happened, you can at least reflect and try to see where the things go wrong. Okay, so I do have to wrap up now. I still will be here throughout the day. But um, what you need to remember from a cybersecurity perspective is the triad, right? They call it the cybersecurity triad, which is the purpose of cybersecurity is to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So uh, keep that in mind when you are preparing your solutions. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think everybody wants to like, come at me, but we are here. We're going to be having lunch, we're going to be networking, and we'll answer all your questions as mentors on Songhe, and um, you can ask all your questions there. Thank you so much. Woo! This is here at Taskbase Africa. For those who don't know, we're a company that gets hired to test security controls of uh, organizations. So, communications, people process. They hire us to pretty much uh, identify gaps into applications and to companies. All right, so, those are my contact details. That's my personal direct phone number. Uh, if you need to reach out to me, welcome to do so. Don't try to call me, I'm unlikely to take a call, but WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, you can find me on Discord, break to fix You can find me on uh, Mastodon, on Sonke, break to fix as well as my handle. Uh, feel free to reach out to me there. Unfortunately, I have to leave around half past one, but uh, as you guys saw, Sufundu is here. Our CTO, Yaz, also is here now as well. So he'll be around to answer any questions you might have. All right, so I want to cover a little bit about the threat landscape, not too much detail that's already been covered by other speakers. Uh, I cover the Red Team CTF, and then the Ideathon Challenge itself, and what you have to do there. All right, so also, as someone that does hacking, it's almost mandatory to have a cat in your presentation, so check, there's a cat. Oh, and I've got a laser pointer and a cat, that's interesting. So, uh, also I have to wear a hoodie. The cap is optional, I just like that. Also, it's not very often I get to wear a cap to presentations, so, you know. All right, so, um, oh, 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 there you go. So, I want to, who, who's familiar with the cartoon, The Roadrunner, and Wiley Coyote and The Roadrunner? Okay. Oh, cool, man. So glad Gen AI or Gen Z still know about The Roadrunner cartoon, that's great. Otherwise, you wouldn't uh, catch this at all. So, um, if you have to look at these two, right, so we've spoken about Red Team and Blue Team. Red Team is there to test and attack, and then the Blue Team is there to defend. All right, so if you look at Wiley Coyote, he's always trying to catch the Roadrunner, right? And he throws everything at the Roadrunner. Anvils, rockets, and nuclear weapons, doesn't matter. The Roadrunner, Roadrunner always gets away. So in this scenario, who are the defenders and who's the attacker? Is the Roadrunner the attacker, or is the Roadrunner the defender? Who says the roadrunner is the attacker? Put up your hands. Who says the roadrunner is the defender? Aha, uh -huh, well you're correct. So the actual attacker is the roadrunner. And the defenders are the ones throwing every single imaginable tool at the roadrunner. Next gen, AI, whatever, doesn't matter. Just throw it at this roadrunner. But the roadrunner just does one basic, simple thing, runs. That's it, but that's it very, very well. And that's what's really the difference between. So, what we found, and then actually, uh, I actually met with a, up with a few friends last weekend, they're like, so what's happening in the industry? Like, what are the latest attacks? What's the latest vulnerabilities that criminals are using to get into companies? And like, dude, it's like the same stuff from 10 years ago. I must be honest. You know, it's not AI, it's not, the, the stuff's coming out, right? There's no attack vectors, which you must consider. But the basics are still not being done right. Right, so when you, when you look at your hackathon challenges and things like that, which I covered just now, just remember that sometimes it's not about the most advanced attack. It's about the, the basic stuff first. You must get the basics right first before you start looking at the advanced stuff. All right, so these are the different types of roadrunners, or let's say attackers that are out there. You've got your script kiddies, you've got organized crime, you've got mission states, you've got hacktivists. These are all different types of threat actors. You can't really control the threat actors. All right, uh, like Dr. Naomi said, the nine-year-old kid is a threat actor. Our children are threat actors. Also quite good at social engineering, aren't you? Very good at manipulating. So you can't really change the threat actor, but what you can do is look at your application that you guys are developing for the hackathon, and look at it and see like, okay, who would want to actually compromise this application? Would it be organized crime? 
is there some monetary value to compromise this application? Am I storing nation state secrets? Am I part of critical infrastructure? Maybe nation states are going to compromise my application. And understanding the threat actor changes what sort of controls you're going to put in place. Because if you're protected against a nation state that can you know, tap your network quite easily or compromise your hardware before it gets to your, your premises, that's a different type of threat actor, right? So you need to understand that. Okay, yeah, so this is already been covered, but what is a, or what is a hacker? All right, and uh, what's an ethical hacker? I guess is always the question. But I always like to say, like, in, a hacker is pretty much anyone that can do anything in a different way. It's a different way of thinking, right? So not necessarily technical. If you can find a creative way of doing something, changing something, a creative way of doing anything, you're a hacker. All right, you think outside the box. You're changing the norms. All right, and an ethical hacker is really the difference is someone that has permission versus someone that doesn't have permission to hack something. It's all about, about permission. All right, so you might think that you do take a lot of favor by testing the security. You're not there. That's illegal. You don't have permission to actually test that. All right, so although it's, very, it's quite an interesting thing, though, right? Because you don't really say, hey, man, are you an ethical accountant or just an accountant? <laughs> you know, it's a very straight. It's, a bit, uh, it's only in, the, in our line of work where it's like you distinguish between the two. But to me, actually, it's actually, the truth is that there are hackers and then there are criminals. Actually, is what it's about. All right, and everyone in this room is a hacker, and the rest of the people that do stuff illegally, with like I said, they're criminals. All right, so that's essentially what it comes down to. So it does come down to ethics, as was mentioned. Um, so which one should you worry about? So it's very important, context is important. All right, I'm going to talk a little, about, a little bit about threat modeling, not uh, too much detail. It's already been covered. Um, but understanding what's the context of your application, what's the context of what your, your environment that you're dealing with, right? So in the background there, you've got some watermelons falling on a guy. Right, so maybe the risk of that guy's watermelons falling on him while he's sleeping. He's got watermelons stacked above him. All right, that's not everyone's threat model, right? Because we all have different, different context. And to me, the very first thing is that context is very, very important. What information you process, how you process it, what application you have, what's the features, why would someone want to compromise it? How? Or for what reason? What do they get out of it? All right, so when you're doing your threat modeling, all right, so we're recovering the CI triad uh, and things like that. Just look at your application, right? You must remember, this is a, a security-focused hackathon, right? So as much as you need to present your, your application, your solution as solving a problem, all right, that's part of the criteria, a very heavy part of the criteria is actually the security of your application. Have you given thought to the security of your application? All right, and the only way to do that properly is to actually do a little bit of threat modeling and go through your application and say, okay, what's the different types of users that can use this application? And not just users that can log in, very people that uh, can just access the application. And now just start following the process of the application, the features. If you're unsure about the, the features, follow the data flow through the application. Right, so someone captures information here, it goes into here, there's an API call that goes to that place, it comes back to here, and everything that process, when you map it out the process, think to yourself, if I'm an attacker, how can I compromise this? If I come in between here and there, what can I actually do? Alright, so there's different ways you can do that, right? There's a, a methodology called Stride, if you want to look at it. Um, so you look at uh, where can stuff be spoofed, tampered with, where, where do you enforce uh, non creation in the process. Alright, so it's very, very important that you look at that because as judges at the hackathon, we're going to ask you, what have you done around security? What's your thoughts around security? Right, if, you, if you're busy presenting an application, I'd be like, and I, I come up with a threat actor that you haven't thought about, it just shows you haven't done proper threat model. Alright, so look at the process. And do a stride analysis. S T R I D E. Um, there's other ones out there. I think stride just uh, is a lot easier to understand. And look at how data can be compromised in that process. And let's just assume because it goes to one API to like some third party, it's safe. It's about the integration between the API and how it comes back. Very, very important. And then just take your thing and break it down. People, process, technology. It's a very, very old concept, almost as old as uh, the CIA, CIA triad. All right, but you can still your application, right? So you have this application set up, 
Who administers the application? Who's allowed to actually access the database and modify records? Who's allowed to add users? What's the process to add users? Can I just log in and add a user as I like? You know, is there a process around that? So very important to map it out. There's this little diagram example. So if you ever want to press the hackathon presentation at the actual ITM Summit, there you have a nice little diagram that shows the different threat actors and how you've thought about the processes and how you've mapped them out. Then you just come in and be like, yeah, look, we're protecting against the almost top 10, yada, 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 that's great. But if I'm sitting there and I think of something that you didn't think of, it's going to be problematic, right? So take your time, make sure you do it properly. And as we mentioned by the speakers, when we actually do it at the end, after you've done building the application, when do you do it? At the end? At the beginning, right? As you build the application, start thinking about security requirements up front. And the straight model is not a one sort of thing, it's doing it every time, iteratively, as you're going through the application. It's pretty much what we do as uh, analysts. We do threat modeling as well as we test the applications ourselves. All right, so this is a uh, cyber kill chain. All right, so it's pretty much against the kind of attack. It's a very, very old concept as well, uh, popularized by Lockheed Martin back in the day. It pretty much breaks down an attack. All right, so how you go about targeting an organization, an application, and it's pretty much dependent on a lot of, uh, I'm not going to go into detail, because I know that I've got limited time. But it really starts off with recon. And I can tell you, it's not, uh, you've seen CSI cyber before. <laughs> yeah, because it's not, there's no Hollywood hacking in what we do. Okay. You know, like we don't sit there like, tap, 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 yeah, shell, and like uh, call it a day. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I can tell you, there's a lot of time spent doing recon, reading up on stuff, checking what you found, researching, a lot of Googling, you know, stuff like that. All right, then you come up with an attack, you weaponize it, and then you deploy the attack. For those of you that want to take part in the Red Team CTF, there's going to be an application we're going to give you at the Archer Web Hackathon. So not the same application that Sifundu got, but uh, he spent a lot of time doing recon, fingerprinting, enumeration, scanning for open ports, fuzzing the application, looking at the input fields, trying to find a way to the application. I mean, he probably spent the majority of his time doing the recon. Before, I hope so, just like throwing you know, everything at the kitchen sink at the server. Alright, so this diagram just pretty much outlines how we go about at a high level conducting an assessment or pen test, as we call it. So information gathering, threat modeling, mobility analysis, exploitation, and then post exploitation, right? Depending on what you want to do. And the most important part of any penetration test is the so for what is it? The report. <laughs> it's uh, by, by no means the most fun part, but it's the most important part. Why is that? Because that's the thing that outlines exactly what was found, how you found it, and how to fix it. All right. So at the hackathon, we got to take part in the Team CTF. We are going to require that you tell us how you got in, but also how to fix it. All right. They just give us problems, one solutions as well. I was going to make a joke at something. Like that. Right, so I just want to highlight this. It was also mentioned earlier that uh, you know, when you visit websites, it's actually on the panel, um, a lot of our websites track a lot of information on you. All right, so um, you know, as part of our testing as well, we do phishing and things like that. As part of our red team, a lot more targeted phishing. And you'll see that when you visit a website, you can get a lot of information on that website, on that device that connects to that website. You know, even if you're not logged into anything, just your, your browser, your IP address, your, your versions of your plugins, all that stuff is a unique identifier of you online. So if you click on a phishing link, even if you don't fall through it, you don't submit your details, I've got information on the operating system you have, the browser you're using, maybe potential plugins that are vulnerable, and they can be used to gather information on you and target you, right? So you can check out those sites, go there. Um, I was actually planning on, I was planning on using my laptop for this presentation. And I saw all the technical issues and I realized I've got a Linux laptop and I didn't feel like I wanted to kill the IT web uh, guys today. So we used to do that laptop. But go on there, have a look and see what you can find. But it's not difficult to find like insecure devices online. Uh, Nathan actually mentioned already. Alright, who's ever played around on Shodan? Alright, no one. Uh, <laughs> obviously just for research purposes. I'm, say I'm not saying that anything dodgy. Alright, so there's a website called Shodan. 
shodan.io. Uh, you can go there, it's actually predefined searches you can actually put in there, right? So you can actually go there and find things like open file shares, specific servers, uh, IP cameras, web cameras, NAS devices, the pepper cut servers that uh, Luther mentioned as part of their challenge. All that stuff can be found on Shodan. Right. If you have a paid for account, you can actually be a lot more powerful with your search queries as well. Uh, also, CSIS is another one that you can look at. There's actually a website called nccan.org. We actually go on there and it just has a whole bunch of IP cameras that are wide open on the internet. And you go there and you can just filter based on South Africa, you can connect on, into, onto open IP cameras in South Africa. In people's homes, their gardens, people's businesses, factories. All sorts of stuff you can actually go there and see. So the question is, why are these cameras just exposed and open online? Why is that? Who's ever bought an IP camera? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, if you buy an IP camera, what are you looking for? You're looking at the features, the price, the security. Which one are you looking at? The price, usually, right? But if you look at the price, and someone's like selling a camera for like 200 bucks, and the other camera's like 3,000 bucks, and the tech is about the same in both cameras, somewhere the other vendors cut on something, and usually that place is security. All right, so you plug the camera in, you install an app, and voila, you can look into your house from an app on your phone, which is great. All right, but so can everyone else because that really. Is if you ever set up an IP cam and there's no prompt for user and a password, you just magically access it on your phone. Let's ask you some of your questions as to why that's the case. Alright, so there's a... Uh, but also things like UPnP on your, on your internal networks, in your home network, right? If you have UPnP enabled on your router, you actually allow the devices to punch out ports and stuff on your firewall, which open up ports on the internet. Which I won't get into, that's uh, how it's going to be. Alright, so is there any secure things? There's a lot of things out there, not just IP cameras. Microwaves, if it mentioned toothbrushes with AI, all that stuff is out there now. All right, so have a look, obviously for research purposes, um, on Shodan and CCAM, have a look. So if you enter this house, and it's a very, I'm gonna use the house analogy because it explains it quite easily. All right, because uh, in the CTF, imagine the CTF as a house. What are the potential entry points into this house? We're in South Africa, we're pretty good at analyzing the entry points into houses. Or at least stopping people from getting in. All right? You ask a shout out. How about the guy down there taking a selfie? Yes, you, sir. <laughs> yeah, man. Tell me, how can you get to this house? Oh, yeah, man, I used to go to HOQ, Jay. So, pick your students that weren't paying attention was my favorite thing. <laughs> so, tell me, what are the potential entry points into this house? Oh man, so what's your question, dude? <laughs> how, how can I get to this house if I want to break in? <laughs> what's that? <laughs> the windows, all right. Thanks, man, for your input. So the windows are potential entry points, the door, and the chimney, right? So what we've all done here is a vulnerability analysis. We've identified potential entry points. Now, a penetration test is when I actually go and try and break into the house. All right? That's a difference between a vulnerability assessment and a pen test. So in a pen test, I actually try and export the vulnerability. So let's say I climb onto this roof and I realize it's actually cemented over. So there's actually no entry point, it's just a fake chimney on top of the roof. Which means it's a false positive. What we call a false positive. Which you can only find if you do the actual test and you climb on the roof and try and climb in. So when you do the rating CTF, you guys will run a lot of tools against our server and our application. You'll scan it for open ports, you'll scan, you'll do fuzzy, which is trying to like guess parts of the application, you'll try to find some files, you'll try to do a lot of stuff, right? But the only way you're going to actually find if it's vulnerable is if you actually try and exploit the vulnerability. Alright, so in the, in the CTF, you can report on potential vulnerabilities like missing headers, stuff like that. But the main thing that's going to help you win the CTF, the Red Team CTF, is if you exploit the vulnerability and you do it so successfully. Like Sifundu did last year around, around this time, but like a month or two from here. All right, so how do you find software vulnerabilities? Now, before I became uh, into security, I used to do a lot of uh, software development, and I was pretty much this guy here. 
They're like, it doesn't work. Why isn't it working? And then I change a few things and it starts to work. I'm like, man, why is this thing working? I don't know, but it's working, so sweet. <laughs> and I just carry on with my life. All right, so that's uh, pretty much how all of it is get uh, introduced, right? Because all the times as developers, the job of the developer is to get stuff working. All right, get functionality done, get business requirements. And uh, at least in the past, security was like an afterthought. It was like the thing that comes after it's working. All right, so if you're looking at an application and you want to find potential entry points, you must look at every single place where there's input into that application. Anywhere where I can input data into your application as someone that's not authenticated, or even if you get stuff from an API and it's coming back into your application and you're processing it, you must ask yourself, how can this be exploited by an attacker? If you pick up a file from a file server and you're analyzing it and processing it, how can someone exploit this potential vulnerability? You know, so you've got to look at all the inputs in your application. All the inputs, hardware-based, software-based, people-based, headers in the web application, everything that comes into your application, look at the inputs. Trace it through, like I said, and see like how, what are the potential ways I can actually attack. All right, and a lot of the vulnerabilities that come about is always from inputs. Either through the headers, through the paths, misconfigurations, it's always through that uh, avenue. All right, so the last top 10, I'm going to cover it again. A very good reference point for the Red Team CTF at uh, the Hackathon. All right, this just shows what's changed between 2017 and 2021. Make sure that you're very, very, let's say, proficient and you understand the OS top 10 before the Red Team CTF at the Hackathon. And why we want to understand is that you actually know how to check for that vulnerability, but also exploit the vulnerability should you need to do it in the CTF. All right, of course, we're always there to help and guide people at the hackathon, which we won't do, but we'll never give you the answer. But we will help you not go down a rabbit hole, because that's something that you can uh, really get stuck into, especially as a pen test or security analyst. Uh, with experience, you realize sometimes you're down a rabbit hole, but like, just keep going, because you need to get something. You know? But uh, at the hackathon, there's limited time, so we'll definitely be there to help you not go down the rabbit hole. So, if you stumble something, try something over and over, uh, just want to speak to us, we'll help you, we'll put you in the right direction. But we never give you the answer though. Because you must have that uh, push. You know, who's ever, who's ever gotten a shell on something? Who knows what is a shell? Alright, some people. Oh, look, it's a similar feeling to like when you've got something to work on your application that you've been struggling with for like hours. That's uh, like euphoria. Like when you get that result, when you hack into a server for the first time, to an application for the first time, I've already described that feeling, but that, it's just like an amazing feeling. And you have to work for that. So it'll just come to you. You know, you can, you can read through, uh, and please, when you try to learn how to hack and do pen testing, don't use the OER method of learning. All right, so that's the thing to suggest that try hack me. There's, there are walkthroughs out there for try hack me boxes. Don't go read the walkthroughs. You're not going to learn anything. You'll be like, oh, oh yeah, that's how you do it. Oh, yeah. And then like, when it comes to you actually do it, you're going to be like, what was that again? Because you never learned it, right? It's the OER oh, method of learning. It's not, it doesn't work. Right, so make sure you complete. It's very, very important. We've spoken about AI and how AI can help you. And it's 100% AI can help you. All right? It can, it can do things a lot quicker for you, but you need to understand what's been done. When you ask AI to generate certain code, you must read through that code and understand what that code is actually doing. Don't just run code randomly that uh, ChatGPT gave you or some other AI gave you, and then you end up getting shelled. Never mind. So just be very careful. All right. So there's injection flaws, which are probably the main ones that uh, get exploited or that might exist. Um, so I want to. Okay, everyone here has done development, right? Who's, who's familiar with SQL or SQL? All right, excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. So, I have a SQL query here at the bottom that says, select splat or star from users where user ID equals many and password equals super long password, which is what I typed into this login form. All right, so it takes my, it takes what I type in here as a variable and just substitutes it into a SQL query, concatenates it, and executes it in SQL. So what's the problem there? Is there a problem? 
I mean, it works. What can I do is, uh, if you, as a developer, right, how can you actually escape the SQL query so that it's always true no matter what I type in? Yeah? Yes, yeah, so all operator, all one equals one, right? Because remember, it's taking my input directly and just substituting the variables with whatever I input here from the client side. And like I said earlier, like, one of the vulnerabilities look at the client side, all the inputs, and consider them untrusted. And how do you implement them? All right, so if I do something like this, I put an apostrophe which, which closes the, the query, all one equals one, and I comment out the rest. So I comment out the query, right? And it's always going to be true, and it will lock me in. All right, but in your application, right, even if it locks me in, there should be other controls in place that will prevent me from doing stuff, right? Like your authorization type controls, role-based controls. And this is just lobby everyone has handled when it's true, you know? So always uh, in, your, in your threat modeling, when you develop your application, I think if you use it like latest frameworks, I mean, you must go out of your way to actually introduce bad practices nowadays. Be something that directly impacts our local communities, which I think is close to everyone's hearts, or if it impacts just the industry as a whole, we always focus back on, you know, what can we do better to make us as South Africans better, right? And I think that also speaks back to, to what Dorian said, is that a lot of the young minds today are looking back at how we can grow our communities digitally as well being a very big one, um, but also how can we make the lives of everyone else around us better. Um, being uh, everyone in South Africa, you know, we, uh, community is a big thing for absolutely everyone and that kind of united um, mentality where we can not only look at almost overseas companies. Habits and a work ethic because um, employers value a work ethic and discipline a lot more than of development operation and security. So there are misconfigurations that you find with your, your, your databases, your, uh, your containers. So as a Gen Z developer, you need to make sure that those are accurate and they can be checked. Because right now, you're going to be dealing with the personal information. There is a fine for your solution um, if it is far not and with uh, Papaya. Or, and also, depending on where you can be hosting your application in South Africa, it is Papaya in favor of you. And if you're going to be hosting it with certain developers in India or China, where they can take that information or where it was found that your databases are not um, are not encrypted, your secret keys are not circulated, they're fixed by so many, anyone can do anything. Or perhaps your workloads or your, they are facing the internet on port 80. That is a very dangerous, um, yeah, it, it's a very dangerous uh, configuration. So as I mentioned, the misconfiguration. So do make sure that anything that you code, it is tested, and if possible, an offline testing is much better than you know, testing within you know, or on production because everyone will be turned down. Another last thing that I can consider since you guys are going to be going into corporate enterprise and so forth. So, of course, I, I'm advising to say uh, there is something core feature currently that is being called SEMO or open authentication. You know, you developing a certain application to a certain company where uh, I'm just reminded that I need to stop talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 no worries, we can catch up on that. <laughs>Just before we wrap up there, um, just one or two things. I think very important to, to what you discussed, and it's uh, secure by design, um, and ensuring that with whatever plans you do come up with is rather look at how you can implement security in the initial stages, in, apologies, initial stages, rather than your kind of bolt-on security right at the end. 
um, that generally you know has a lot more overhead when you need to go back redesign your code. And then two is that privacy statement is whenever you look at you know WhatsApp's new feature with the yeah, meta and you know all of that going through. When you aren't necessarily paying for a product, but financially you're paying with your data, and that's that's always a consideration we're going to have to keep um, top of mind when we go forward with any kind of um, well, you know, popular uh, any kind of local regulatory frameworks that we need to abide by is how you're going to use that data, and are you going to notify those who you're using the data from that you are using that kind of data, what kind of data you're using, what are you using for. Uh, so yeah, that's my last thing. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm going to direct a question to Sipundo, because everybody wants to know that one. And then my last question to the rest of the panel would be, any final words of advice? In 30 seconds, mashallah. <laughs> All right, so question to Sipundo would be, how do we win this hackathon? <laughs> like Saras, how do we win? In a minute, how do we win? You want me to stand up? That's fine. So, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware that the hackathon, I think it's divided into like three. So there's blue team and then you can develop a solution and then there's red team. In. So, uh, blue team in, you're basically defending, right? And then we at Telespace, we attack the offensive guys. So anyone who will be joining the right team in the hackathon, um, yeah, how to win. So, so it's, it's not easy, right? Um, but you can do it, because the actual hackathon is in June. Uh, it would have been nice if it's something that you, maybe you started playing with cybersecurity and just playing on, on platforms like Try Help Me, so you can write that down. You can go practice there, try help me. It's like ten dollars a month. It's 180. A lot of you can afford it. So just just play there and then just practice, practice. And then the, the, the challenge that we're gonna give you now is gonna be simple. Um, you, you, you can learn while you're doing it, and then you can qualify for the actual hackathon. And then the actual hackathon, I, I can't really tell you what we've built for you guys, however. It's going to be something simple for as long as you practice and use uh, Try Help Me. And after this session, we're going to walk around and I'm going to give you guys advice. I'll just look at this, look at this, and this will help you. Because there are so many things that you still have to learn. I can't wrap up everything in one minute that you'll have to learn to win the hackathon. It's a lot, uh, but you can do it. It's not, it's not easy, but it's simple, so don't worry. So after this, whoever is doing the right team in uh, challenge, uh, just let, let us know, and then we're going to come to you, and then we'll tell you to focus on this and this and this. Uh, we'll make sure that you, you win. Yeah. Final words. Final advice. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah, last 30 minutes is that... Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in order for you to be the hacker, you need to think like a, like a hacker, so know thy enemy. And the last word is uh, practice. Keep on practicing because I know many things are new or many things will be new, but as much as you practice and asking questions, you'll get far. Thanks. What I can say is, number one, know the product that you're building. Um, do a market research study, you know, do a visibility study, and check how many people have built uh, similar products and where, they, and where are they today. Uh, number two, check if it's scalable. You know, can, 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 can we take it into market? Can we, can, can, can we grow it? You know, can we take it into business? Can we invest in it? I mean, like, does it have any return on investment? And number three, if you guys are five, one of you guys has to be responsible for the presentation, the other one is responsible for the demo, for the pilot, and another one is responsible for security and stuff. So you need to segment your team into, into, into you know, different groups and you need to understand what your strengths are. And uh, please don't be afraid. Uh, 
don't be don't be shocked because the other person speaks great English and a hackathons don't have anything to do with English. You just want to see if you can build products and you can take them to market and you know exactly what you were actually dealing with. And those who are doing, you know, uh, the capture the flag challenge, it's very important that you know you rub shoulders with either Telspace or Snowed, uh, and you understand exactly what mechanism, you know, uh, you need to understand things like your standard geography, your digital forensics, how do they want you to actually, you know, find the instance. So he's right about, you know, um, getting, signing up to, to labs which will assist you with your challenges. And yeah, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Okay, I think my final word of advice is most systems can be hacked and anyone can be a hacker. And um, my nine-year-old frustrated my 14-year-old because she kept unlocking his phone. First time because Android couldn't um, distinguish between her face and his, so she used her face. And then um, eventually, um, when, I don't know, maybe he changed, she, he had his face on as a screensaver, so she faced um, went towards the mirror and unlocked his phone. So just thinking outside the box shows that even a nine-year-old can hack a secure system. When uh, Sfudo was talking about uh, there's a lot that you needed to do, I thought I was going to mention that watch season one, two, three of uh, <laughs> Mr. Robot. <laughs> right? Yeah, but uh, on a real, uh, be a sponge, right? And uh, don't be a sponge in a desert, be a sponge in water, meaning that you need to find yourself with the information. There's a lot of mentors here and people with uh, some level of expertise that will guide you into your solutions. And when I'm saying be a sponge again as well, I'm not saying integrate everything that you hear from all of us because some of us will drive you into madness because we're mad people again as well. But filter that information to something that you can build as for a solution. So it's be a sponge in water, sharp, but also filter that information and uh, be always willing as to learn or find another way. There's always a way to get us into systems. Oh, and then lastly, don't uh, go for uh, what's this aesthetics, right? Most of the time, build something that's functional that solves the problem. Aesthetics comes after. I don't think it matters if you say, you know, I'm so good with coming up from, with templates uh, from uh, Impulse Trap or I'm building this React Jail, I'm, I'm building with React and I want it to look fancy. If it's fancy but doesn't solve the problem, then you don't have a working solution. So find first how to build the solution, solve the problem, and then you can add the aesthetics later if you've got time. Thank you. Uh, my advice to, to everyone, uh, because I can see, I, <laughs> I can see that almost everyone here is a student. So my advice would be, I know that we use the AI a lot, and as someone who's also a student assistant, I've noticed something that a lot of students, they copy. And then if you copy, that's wrong. So just use all AI tools and then make sure that you paraphrase your way. <laughs> before you send it. So if you're going to generate code with ChatGTP, just use another AI to change it. And then use another one to change it. Maybe <laughs> use the you use something like CodePen. There's a website called CodePen. So you go to that website and then you type sign in. It's going to give you a code of a signing page. Take that code, change it with uh, ChatGTP or Copilot or Gemini or Perplexit before you submit. Because if we find out that you submitted something similar to another student, you may be dismissed for like two years. So before you submit, please paraphrase. That's my advice. Like paraphrase, paraphrase. <laughs> One or two considerations from my side, I think keep it innovative, but also keep it simple. Um, by over-engineering it, you can create complexities for yourself, um, and that's when you people start losing the plot of what you know that message you're trying to convey. And two, I think a, a very big um, consideration for for the security environment, regardless, is really anything's hackable. You know, it's not if it's when, so, so just also bear that in mind, so thanks a lot.
keep it going. Thank you so much to my panelists for this amazing discussion. We really appreciate you guys. And Dr. Mashallah, you and, you and I must talk about time. But thank you guys very much. Just give them a round of applause.